Okay, you look handsome already. Stop moving. <laughs> okay. I'm focused. Yay! So this is uh, my repeat guest, Bob Wan, today. And uh, if you have been watching my um, fireside chat with Jesse, uh, Bob was the episode two guest. If you want to know more details about all his history past, you can go watch uh, episode two. <laughs> today, <laughs> we want to focus majority about um, the questions since episode two. A lot of people have reached out to me and Bob about their personal, for their firm, specifically about their own concerns and questions, how to develop their firm. So today we are going to discuss that. Yeah. So Bob, you can uh, have a brief introduction about yourself again, just in case somebody oh. doesn't know you when they watch the YouTube. <laughs> sure. Sounds good. Um, yeah. So my name is Bob. My firm is called Legacy Advantage. Uh, we are a CPA firm, but we only do bookkeeping, so that will make that's what makes us a bit different. Um, and in, just in terms of the the format, Jesse, I, I think I really I might really enjoy this uh, because you know I recently spoke at the QuickBooks uh, Connect Toronto, and I had a chance to speak about my journey to growing from zero to a million dollar business. And you know, basically, uh, I left I think 40 minutes or maybe 30 minutes in, for a Q and A, and it was really really awesome because. The whole, the whole time, like my intent for that talk is to help people where they're at. Um, and so that really gave us a lot of time to, you know, ask people, people ask me questions and then I can answer them based on their situation to help them where they're at. So I'm really looking forward to this. That's great. So um, for myself, I'm the account manager for BC. I uh, dealing with majority just QuickBooks online accountant and the profile. And in the future, we'll have a lot more new things, exciting in PVOA. I cannot say anything now, but uh, that's my job to let all my firm and uh, bookkeepers and accountants in BC aware of the benefits. So that's my job as a account manager in BC. And uh, I used to work in Ontario, East Ontario. So that's how I know Jennifer Moore and Tamata and Tanya. They were all my clients before. So now they're all the firm of the future, same as Bob. Bob is the king of West Coast. <laughs> West Coast. West Coast okay, so I future. have a question um, in my phone. I got a message. Sure. <clears throat> Let me pull it up. So this question I think is very common. Um, somebody asked me, um, how do you get uh, clients, especially um, QBO ready clients in your firm? QBO ready because clients? Yes, yeah, because you only do uh, cloud paperless, right? You do not uh, do any desktop or stage. So how do you find those clients uh, who's already uh, in the cloud or they are ready to be cloud? That's another one, this is. <laughs> yeah, you know, I have to think about that. How did you get those people? <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, I I think part of it is just you have to be willing to say no. Um, yeah. We've had yeah. a lot of clients come to us say, uh, "Hey, would you use desktop or would you use Sage?" And I simply said, "No, sorry." And and you just you just got to be okay with with saying that right from day one. I I know I lost a couple of clients or I should say I didn't get those opportunities because they wanted to stay with Sage. And I lost a couple of other ones as well because they wanted on-site bookkeeping with QuickBooks Desktop. Now, you know, we do on-site bookkeeping, but you know, our minimum price for that is $1,200 a month. So, you know, for some clients, oh, it makes sense. For That's our starting point, yeah. Can I do your on-site bookkeeping? <laughs> What's that? I want that job to be on site and charge people 1200 per month. Yeah, but honestly, it's not even like I want to, it's not even I want to charge 1200 It's like I really don't want to go. So if you really want me to go, you have to pay <laughs> up, right? Or by me, I mean the, the team. And so part of it is, you know, building a cloud ready firm is just making sure that you take on the right clients. Um, and I think the other, the other comment is I would say it really depends on how you source these clients. So, you know, if you're, let's say, for example, doing a lot of networking, you'll probably get a, a, a mixed batch of people that are cloud ready and those that are not. But if you focus your effort on building a digital channel where your clients inquire about your services through digital, 
then those clients are more likely to be cloud ready. So, uh, you know, for example, we have a, an office in Surrey, which is in the suburbs, and then we have an office in Vancouver, which is kind of the metro, uh, you know, urban area. And most of our online leads come um, from Vancouver because for some reason, Vancouver uh, people are more inclined to search for bookkeeping services online. And if they search us for us online, then they're more likely to use technology. So with Surrey clients, it's not always the case where we have to actually convert a lot of them from desktop to Sage or from whatever to, to QuickBooks, on, sorry, from, from desktop to online or from Sage to online. And, and those referrals, uh, those clients always, almost always come from referrals. And we found those are not as technologically ready. So I think my, my answer is, is two part. Number one is making sure you define your practice and sticking to it and not taking the clients um, that you don't want. And second of all is just look at your marketing channel and seeing if your leads are coming in the right way. Does that make sense? Yeah. So because you have so many people help you, right? A lot of um, yeah. my, my bookkeeper and accountant, they are by themselves. So they want to find what's the best way easier for them to be more uh, efficient to find the leads because they are the ones do their own bookkeeping for all the clients. They are only one person, right? So what's your advice for those people? That's the one, um, <clears throat> their major concern. Right. So, um, and I, and I totally understand we weren't, we weren't a big firm always like in the beginning <laughs> we had to do everything. Right. So I, I totally understand where that question is coming from. And I think the hardest part about that is, um, doing the work and getting the work. It's, it's a totally different mindset. If I need to go out and do, um, marketing and networking, I have to like change my mindset and I have to put on a mask. I have to say like, okay, I gotta be ready to like talk to human beings. And, yeah. and you have to kind of get into a mo 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 momentum. And once you get out of the momentum, then it, it takes more time to get into momentum. So for example, you know, I get five clients uh, through my networking and I got really, really good. And then I start doing the work. And then when I'm working, I'm not networking. And so when I ran out of work or when I'm ready for new clients, I have to go back into my networking mindset to get more clients. And so this back and forth, it, it, it's really, really exhausting. So, um, and I, so I totally get where you're coming from. And, and I would say um, um, to, to just, I guess, keep doing the networking. So I, I think my message was at, at the conference, was the first 10 to 20 clients, don't worry about branding. Don't worry about, you know, past digital leads and all that kind of stuff. You're just pouring money into a very, very large hole. In the beginning, just do networking, right? And most of the networking events are, all, all, uh, most networking events are kind of before hours or after hours. So join a BNI group. They usually meet between six to nine a.m. So I'm part of that. That really, really helped. That forces you to go out and build those relationships every, you know, Tuesday and Wednesday or whatever, right? And then networking events, most of the time, uh, they also have it in the evening. So starting four o'clock, five o'clock. So you know, just put in a regular day at your office and then go to those networking events and be consistent about it. So commit to going to one or two every single week and never get out of that momentum. So that's huge. And that's, I think, the best way to get to the first 10 to 20 clients. Once you're at that level and maybe you have one staff and you're obviously still involved in the day to day, but you want to get some passive leads, then you start working on um, the digital, digital stuff. And, you know, we have, we have a da dashboard that tracks all of our leads and our number one source is still search engine optimization, search engine optimization. So Google organic results, right? We poured thousands and thousands of dollars. Pardon me? It's just uh, from your advertisement or? Yeah. So with Google, we have the ads and then we have the organic uh, search results, right? So if you look on Google or search, whatever, there's the ad portion and then there's the organic results, right? And so we spent thousands of dollars in, in those Google ads and they were very expensive and they were not affected at all. However, as we increase our organic results and increased our organic position in Google, that's where the real lead generation came from. So I, I, so I would say, you know, um, if you're small and you don't have a lot of resources, do not hire an SEO agency. Okay. They, mm -hmm. they charge a lot and they don't necessarily offer a lot. There's, there's two parts to SEO. One is the on-site portion, which is 
um, optimizing the website itself for you know keywords and all that kind of stuff. That stuff you can probably hire a technical person on like Fiverr or um, you know freelancer.com whatever to get your site optimized for a very low price. Okay, and then the next portion is the um, the backlinks. Uh, that's the offsite SEO. And there's a whole bunch of other things as well, like consistency and directories and stuff. But um, writing good articles to post on your website and post on other people's websites that link back to you is really, really helpful. So, for example, you know, I got the opportunity to write for From the Future and a couple of, the, a couple of blogs I, I wrote myself. And I said, look, I think this is going to be really helpful for your audience. Why don't you post it? And it, in the blog that I submitted, I, I referenced legacy advantage right so when google oh. scrubs the internet when google scrubs the internet it thinks oh like quickbooks is referencing legacy legacy must be oh, good oh that's how it works i was wondering the cross uh, reference on the website for the like people yeah, it's always called, it's encourage you to reference the home page of your own company home page when you um, try to answer other people's questions or you post something on other people's blog or web page, so you always reference your own company. So they can come back to you. That's the organic research you that's find right. very engaging. Okay, that, that makes more sense. Yeah, and so what Google is saying, like the more websites, other websites, point to this one website, the more likely this website has a lot of authority, right? And the higher the authority, the higher the ranking. And so what you want to do is put in the effort to put a lot of content on other people's blogs that are valuable and that reference mm -hmm. back to you, and so Google will think, okay, you know, this site is legit, right? So that's that's a that's a hard way to increase SEO, but it's very very effective. So I guess the you I know, think to, uh, guys, this is good. Yeah, to, to to summarize, you know, my answer to you, and number one is to be consistent in your networking. Number two, as you're ready to build your brand, you know, obviously create the website, but work on your offsite SEO by adding value to other blogs and having them post your blogs that reference back. Okay, so now the next question is a follow-up question for this one. That one says, um, so say you already have your leads come in, like you already got the potential new client. What's your um, internal process from get the leads until they become your official client? Uh, how do you make that efficiency to onboard new clients? What's the process step by step? Yeah. Right. Um, so the the process. Uh, so I, let's say, okay, I get a lead, um, and I get a lead in several ways. Number one is they call me, and yeah. uh, so you know, get on the phone, do a quick chat. The other lead, way I get a lead is they submit a form online, and the third way that I get a lead is is probably through a client referral or a uh, like an accountant referral. So those are the leads. I think step number one that I take is just get on the phone with them and just ask them a few questions like, uh, tell me about your business. Why are you switching? Um, you know, what do you want us to do? And at that moment, I um, make a decision. Number one, if their uh, workflow is very clear and they're a small client, I, I would probably give a quote right on the phone. But I, uh, mm -hmm. but I really try to be super clear before I actually give a quote because most of the time when I give a quote over the phone, it's almost always wrong because I prefer to think about it. So um, the other way is, okay, if they're really small and they're under our minimum fee, I'll probably just tell them our minimum fee. If they're a bit more complex and they're a bit bigger and there's a couple of vagueness, vague, vague points in what they're telling me, I would say, okay, sounds great. Thank you for calling me. Um, it sounds like we need to carry on this conversation in an in-person meeting. Can we book a time to meet in person? And that's, I think, why we have a physical office or have two physical offices, because I still believe higher value clients, the bigger clients, they want to see you face to face before they're ready to pay you about $1,200 a month, right? So, mm -hmm. um, so that's why we say, look, let's book a meeting. I'm, I can come to you or you can come to me and we'll sit down and hash it out. So, in that face-to-face -face meeting, um, I have a list of questions that I go through, and it's called uh, the discovery questions. And those are the questions that I would go through to to understand the workflow. So, you know, who's doing revenues, who's doing receivables, who's doing payroll, who's doing expensive expenses. Because sometimes the clients say, "Look, I'm comfortable doing invoicing, I'm comfortable in marketing invoices off as paid, but I don't want to do expenses." Okay, great. Some clients say, "Look, I want you to do everything, like invoice, receipt, payment, everything." 
obviously there are different prices, right? Uh, timing. So do they want their reports first week of the month, like first day of the month? Uh, we have a client that says, I want my reports two business days after month end. Okay, well, you got to pay a premium, right? Um, some clients say, look, I don't, I don't care. Just give it to me quarterly. Okay, I'll give you a discount. So all those little things impact the price. And so after, after that meeting, after, you know, we build some rapport and, 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 and trust, and I come back with a list of specifications. Yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, and, um, and I basically uh, write a proposal. And the software that I use for proposals is called Better Proposals. I think I mentioned that in the several uh, QuickBooks blogs, QBHQ, uh, sorry, uh, posts. Better Proposals are really awesome. It's templated. You just fill in you know, the, the scope of work, the pricing, and then I send it off. So that's how I propose, I send a proposal. <laughs> and then uh, couple, you know, I would follow up once a week. Once they sign, then um, I send an email with the next step saying, look, thank you. Uh, please uh, send me this, that this, that authorization. Um, we also use Rotessa for payment. That way we know we get paid all the time. Um, so say, well, here's a link to fill, fill out a pre-authorized debit. And then, um, and then we get going. So, you know, you asked about how to make the onboarding process uh, efficient. I don't think our process is efficient at all. I don't actually necessarily want it efficient. Um, I want it to be slow, careful, because that's where this is the time where you actually determine whether or not the client is a good fit. So if they keep rescheduling on you, okay, they're probably not too responsible, right? Um, if, for example, it takes them forever to read through a, a proposal, they're probably not really interested. And so I would say in this phase, this is one phase that I would not focus on efficiency at all, but focus on effectiveness, you know, seeing if there's a the right fit, all those um, kind of uh, soft qualities. It sounds like um, you take uh, a lot of time pre-qualify them. So when you do your initial setup meeting, do you charge them an initial setup fee for uh, uh, consulting? Um, no. So I don't charge the fee to give them a quote. Uh, okay. I, yeah, but I do charge fees for for after they sign an engagement, and part of our engagement is having a setup and cleanup component. So um, let's say their bookkeeping is really you know, messy, that's what we, ch we charge. But I, I do not charge for uh, providing the consulting. You know, I, I know some people have a different perspective on that. I just, I personally don't feel comfortable in doing that. Um, mm -hmm. I want to add a lot of value to the client before I ask for something back. And part of the value that I add, that I bring forth is basically providing them with a, a solution. And, you know, I think there's no right or wrong answer. It's just for us, for me. I would rather give more value than I take, and um, and it's part of the, kind of the building trust process, right? If you build trust by adding a lot of value first, and then they're willing to trust you later on. So that's just my perspective. It doesn't have to be yours. That's why people are willing to pay twelve hundred because they trust you. They think you worth it. I guess so, because because I've already added a lot of value to them, right? I've I've already given them all yeah. the solution. I've already diagnosed their problem, and they're like, okay, I I think I owe this guy something. <laughs> <laughs> it's called guilt marketing. Guilt marketing. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you have kind of an internal uh, CRM? Do you use for this process? Like you said, you have a proposal software. You have some something else. So all this combination together. How many um, apps or CRM do you use for your internally for this process? Right. I think uh, I think it's just about it's just two. Uh, I don't complicate it too much. So um, when it when a lead comes in, um, you know, I take the phone calls and whatever. And I, at that point, I actually don't enter it anywhere. Um, it's only after I send a proposal that I add it to our actual CRM called Podio. Now, again, this is probably Podio. wrong because okay. we're supposed to track it when they first call you, but I just don't have discipline to do that just yet. So I'm like, why am I tracking this when they may not even be interested? So um, again, it's just kind of my laziness. A better proposal is really awesome because it tracks all the proposal you sent and yeah. you know shows the value and even calculates uh, the success rate. So um, yeah. you, you know, with that metric, you can actually predict um, what your success rate is going to be. So, you know, these oh. months, um, 
I send out between ten to fifteen thousand dollars of proposals every month, and our close rate is about fifty percent. So we can actually predict that if we continue to send our proposals between ten to fifteen thousand a month, we can probably close between five to six thousand dollars in re revenue per month, and so that helps wow, us with budgeting as well. Do they do an engagement letter in that proposal software? Exactly. So it's actually just a engagement letter, but digital. And I send it out. They digitally sign it. We're good. Oh, they can do a digital sign. So they can just say, "This is my signature." They send it back. This. Is that yep. docu sign from the Adobe, right? Um. Yes. Yes and no. Better proposal is actually way more beautiful <laughs> than docu sign. Oh, really? Yeah, DocuSign just takes your PDF and makes it into a yeah. signable pro program. Better proposal, yeah. it's like it's like flipping through a picture book, and then yeah. at the end, there's a space for you to sign. I think that's the question from Art Sit. He's from um, Richmond in Vancouver. He he last time asked, oh, what kind of a um, electronic signature document I can have my client to sign the agreement letter? And proposal, that's what he was asking. So you use Yeah, this, better uh, proposal is, is amazing. Better proposal. They're they're pretty cheap as well. It also integrates with other software. So if you use I think um uh, if you use some CRM, they can actually talk to each other. So when you set a proposal, it actually push it pushes automatically oh. to the CRM. And it oh, has really? integration with a uh, chat software. So you know on some websites, let's say you go to Pluto.com, there's a there's a little chat function on the on the website, yeah. right? So yeah. with better proposals, you can actually integrate that chat function to the proposal. So when the clients have a question, they can actually chat with you, like as they're reading the proposal. It's pretty cool. Wow, that's cool. Okay, move on to next question. Next one is about um, uh, your internally. So uh, they want to know how do you grow your associates? Like the last time you mentioned at uh, our meetup in um, New York Grill. Um, they uh, they are very blew away by the by the way you manage your team members. You recruit them as associates, so they just want to know how do you develop them as a good loyal employee to be a associate. Yeah, that's the question. Good. So before I answer mine, let me maybe get your your opinion. So Jesse, it sounds like you're you love into it, right? Yes. So. What makes you love working there? Okay, first of all, they don't pay me as much as other company I could get a job. Yes. But why do you I work there? Find, well, first of all, um, I really appreciate they give me the opportunity uh, to develop my own skills in my position. So as you know, I do a lot more stuff than I'm supposed to do in my current position. But they give you this uh, space to grow. Uh, they give you the opportunity to connect with the person you need to achieve your own personal career target. So I have this all the opportunity to go to TV Connect, go to San Jose, and uh, internally I have marketing, I have other people who's willing to help at any time if I need anything to achieve my personal goal. So at this point, money is not uh, the major concern. Consider of, about the whole package. The other thing, you don't laugh at me. I like work at Intuit because the cafeteria, the the food is great <laughs> at my Mississauga office. <laughs> so I really love my uh, like kitchen staff. They are really friendly. Every day you go there, you buy a lunch or breakfast. They are so friendly to you. They tell you exactly what's healthy choice. And uh, our building manager really develop a lot of healthy choice, especially for somebody like me, I have cancer. So I prefer to eat some specific food, not like everybody else, they can just eat everything. So I have a lot more choice here. <laughs> I used to work for other companies. First of all, some of them, they don't have cafeteria. Some of them have, but it's not as good. So the lady I go there every day to talk to, I was, I was looking forward to go eat my lunch. Yeah. I don't I don't think that's the main reason for most of you, but for me that's very important. Yeah. That's awesome. Um sorry, I, my furnace just came on. Can you still hear me okay or should I move? I can I can hear you. You can hear me? Okay. Yeah, so I think you know, basically what you said is you like autonomy. Yeah. 
you like the opportunity to to have some sort of mastery, the ability to achieve yeah. something. And you didn't mention, but I, I'm sure you love what you do because there's a purpose component to it. You know, you, you, you're yeah. on purpose yeah. to do something. And then you have these fringe benefits. And basically what you're saying, number four, is that your employer really cares and they yeah. show and they show care um, by doing certain things such as offering great food, you know, building a great community, hiring the right people to service you. So basically that's what we've done. I think there's nothing special about what we do. It's, it's about okay. just like putting, put, like I put myself in my associate's shoes and thought, what, what would I want from my employer if I were an associate? And so there's a book called Drive by Daniel Pink. It talks about uh, every person, uh, employee, employee engagement is relying on two things, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Autonomy. So to what extent do your employees have the ability to achieve and do the things they want because they want it, not because you told them to? Yes, do they have control yes, about the where they work, how they work? Like, do they have autonomy over everything, or are they just your slave, right? Number two yes. is mastery. Do they have the opportunity to master something, to be really, really good at something? And so, you know, let's say you're running an accounting and bookkeeping firm. Are they always learning? Are they growing? And if they're not, how can you structure a business in such a way that they are growing? So that's, you know, what a lot of bookkeeping firms, they struggle in retaining um, uh, their associates because, you know, their bookkeeping work doesn't allow them to actually grow. And so I, don't, I hear a lot of bookkeepers say, you know, I don't trust my staff to do all the hard work because they're going to do it wrong. So I might as well do it myself. Well, you know, you're right, but you're taking away the opportunity for them to grow and to, to have mastery. I'm, I'm the opposite. I say, look, it's a hard thing. Let me teach you and coach you. It's going to cause, you know, it's going to, it's going to um, cause me to lose time. But like you are growing, you are learning, you are becoming better. And that's way more worthwhile. Right. And the third one is purpose. So you know, a lot of bookkeeping firms and accounting firms, they don't really have a purpose. So like, what are you actually doing, right? And for us, you know, we're number one, we obviously want to add a lot of value to our clients so they can build generational businesses. But for us, you know, we're also creating, trying to create something awesome, amazing, and, and, and people want to be part of something big, right? And so that's the three things, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And then the, the fourth one is, is about care. So you know, how can you show your employees care? Um, so a few other things, you know, we have monthly lunches. It costs me money, straight from the bottom line, but it builds community, right? People love it. And it doesn't, you know, it, it's, it's a very little small price to pay for that. We have a, a very unique policy. We have an unlimited budget for, uh, for nonfiction books. So any book you want to read, I'll buy it. It's on me. Wow, really? Yeah. Any book you want that's nonfiction, we'll buy it. And again, it's not very expensive. Like I maybe spend 50, 100 bucks a month on books, but they love it because they're growing, they're learning, and they, they know that we are supportive in that, right? Um, things, and then we also have a, a leadership, leadership mastermind group where um, you know, every month we read a book together, and then we come together and talk about a book and learn about leadership. And so again, that, that speaks to the value of mastery right and and also you know we want to grow leaders so this is our way to help them become better so my question to you is you know if you're having trouble retaining your clients what are you sorry trouble retaining your employees what are you actually doing to help them be better what are you doing for them to show that you actually care not about uh, sorry that to show them that you care about them as human beings but also you care about their career right mm -hmm. <laughs> That's good. That's exactly what I think. And um, I feel like your associates, you also encourage them to onboarding new clients based on the revenue so they get more paid, right? That's important too. Because I'm in sales position, I love commission. <laughs> I was like, I want to go more. I want to go get more. So that's exactly the thing. So Right. So that that's another component is um, the incentive, right? So we didn't talk about money because like you said, um, once the other pieces are in place, like, the, the autonomy, mastery, and purpose, the money becomes uh, less important, but still important, right? Yeah. And, and yes. so, so again, how can you structure a compensation in such a way that you incentivize people for the right behavior, and you obviously de-incentivize them to, 
for the wrong behavior, right? So we pay mm-hmm. people based on the percentage of revenues. So if they do well, I give them more clients so they make more money. If they do yes. poorly, I take clients away from them because they're not fit to service as client, then all of a sudden they get paid less. And so this this like back and forth of tying performance to compensation is really, really important. Yes. So uh, another thing I can think of is uh, You look so confused. Sorry, I have some kind of difficulty. Can you hear me now? I can hear you, yeah. But someone's also ringing. I think I forgot to put in my status. Sorry for that. I will just. Oh, no problem. Put yeah. In the middle. So I, I have uh, Stacy here. Uh, Stacy, uh, she cannot talk, but she typed her question. So I will just read her question for you. So Stacy has. Um, a question about uh, about her own growth and uh, she said there's way too many choices on what software to use sorry yeah she, I... she, has, she has way too many so- choices for software to use and uh, also the document management and the retrieving tools and the payroll so she said did you find there are too many at first and then what is the key opponent for you to choose which ones you want to use right um so stacy i I can totally relate uh and funny that you asked so we implemented hubdoc maybe two, three months ago, and we don't have Receipt Bank. Uh, we just implemented Expensify, and we don't use WagePoint. So, you know, there's a, there's actually a TED Talk that says, uh, having too many choices actually makes you unable to choose. And I feel like this is this is the case, and I, and I totally can relate. And so for the longest time, I didn't choose. I didn't take any action. But you know what? I focus on building the business. So don't let tools and software be the reason for you to stop growing because you feel like you're not ready. Okay. Um, and so, like, you know, there, there weren't always software tools. I think the best tool that you have is QuickBooks Online. And once you have that, you can have workarounds for everything, right? So just start, start pushing, start driving, and then start implementing software one at, one at a time. So, um, so let's say, you know, January, you're going to commit to sticking with researching and sticking with one payroll software. And in that month, you book four demos for payroll, right? And then, you know, most of the time, there actually is no one right answer. It's just what works for you. Some people love which point. Some people don't. It's, it's not right or wrong. Just stick with one and that becomes your process. But make sure you only stick with one. Um, because then, then you, only then you, can you be more efficient. So that you know another reason why we don't use um, you know stage or or zero. I know some bookkeeping practices use all three. It's like you need to be focused on your time so you can be the best at a particular thing and forget about everything else, right? So um, does that make sense? Like don't let software be the reason for you to not grow. Jesse, I can't hear you. I think you're uh, you're muted. I'm not muted. Can you hear me now? Oh, I can hear you now. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. yeah, I had an interrupted call with somebody, so they they interrupt my connection. But uh, if you can still hear me, we just keep going. Yeah. Oh. Uh, if Stacy doesn't come back to me, I will just move on to the next question for people. Go. Cool. So, <laughs> they said, Bob. Um. Do you use QVO payroll? <laughs> and do you know anything about advanced payroll? What's your opinion about it? <laughs> I love QuickBooks. <laughs> Next question. No. Um, you know what? There's 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 a couple ways to answer this. So yeah, I'll answer the question directly. Uh we don't recommend people to go on QuickBooks payroll online. We have not yet tried QuickBooks Online Advanced Payroll. 
because uh, during the period that we don't use Quick, uh, we stop using QuickBooks Online Payroll, we we'll switch almost everyone to Payworks. Payworks is similar to Ceridian, ADP, but they're Canadian and they love it. So, and I'm sorry, and, and we love it. And they're, uh, they're local, they have really, really great customer service. So almost all of our clients are on Payworks. Um, but the, the other underlying, um, you know, a question that I want to answer is, again, don't let software be a hurdle, um, a reason for you to not do something. So, like, yes, software doesn't work 100%. So just find a way to push through, to find a workaround. You know, everybody is trying to do their best, and I, and I can really appreciate that. You know, don't don't lose your shirt over it, <laughs> right? If it doesn't work, move on. Find another software and um, and just keep building your business. Yeah. Well, I should really get a Scott to hear this part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're doing a good job, Scott. <laughs> I can I can feel that you know you really care. You're trying your best, but sometimes software is software. I know he's uh, in Mountain View right now to uh, try to. Um... Make the TBO and advanced payroll work better. That's why he's not in the office. So, well, that's a good answer. So, um, I do agree with you. If you think the payroll doesn't work, you can find a solution actually works for you, right? So it's not like you have to stay with it. And the other question is another about um, how to manage your uh, clients internally. So, for example. Uh, you have the internal multiple people manage all the clients, but different uh, employee manage the clients, right? So yeah. Do you use uh, like a like a CRM or workflow apps to help you manage those? Yeah. yeah so we use Podio to manage tasks and due dates and client information, client data. At a glance, we can see who's responsible for what. But, uh, and, and, and I've talked to a few other larger bookkeeping firms and, you know, they have a pretty advanced way to monitor progress. And, um, you know, we, we tried doing that, but, but we failed in, in implementing a, a software to monitor progress because software at the end of the day, like I said, is just a tool of garbage in, garbage out. So in order for you to have good data for you to monitor, your employees have to actually update the CRM, like they spend a lot of, they waste a lot of time updating the CRM. And so, you know, we've been able to basically rely on our culture to deliver high quality work. And so, and I think it actually works better because uh, we put so much responsibility uh, on our associates, right? So um, one of our core values is entrepreneurship. And that just means owning your clients, owning you know your responsibilities, and delivering it. And so when that doesn't happen, we have a conversation with the um, with the employee and say, "Look, you did not follow our core value. You fell short here, and you need to improve, or else, right?" Um, and and obviously we do um, you know quality checks and file reviews every once in a while, and you know, every month actually actually. Two, two file reviews per employee per month, and then we rotate through the clients, and we do obviously a final year-end check. So, you know, we do have checks and balances in place, but we don't necessarily monitor um, our, our, our associates. And I think that comes back to the, the fact that we want to give our employees autonomy, the ability to, to do things themselves, and we want to demonstrate that we trust them um, by not having them, by not monitoring their every action. Right. And, and that, that's become our culture to, to really trust them. Like, look, this is your client. You have to deliver. OK. <laughs> and they're like, OK. <laughs> so um, you don't really just assign the task to them. So, for example, you have 200 clients and then uh, you don't just go in there, assign the task. OK, employee one, do this 10 client, employee two, do this three client. You don't. Yeah, we do. We, we, yeah, we do do that. Okay. Um, okay. But we don't necessarily check, oh, have you done the bank rec for this client yet? Or have you filed a GST for this client oh, yet? Does that mean, yeah, we, we obviously tell people who they're responsible for, but we don't check the, the details. So how do you know they actually done the work the client actually needed? I yeah, well, we... 
have a process maybe once in a while you randomly audit something or check something yeah like i said we do file reviews so a lot of things come up during that time and we provide feedback and um so and and some sometimes you know we do miss it we the file review misses it and the clients are unhappy and we learn from there so yeah i mean we're not perfect <laughs> The, this one has specific apps question. I don't know if you use this app, so but somebody asked me, um, what's the, uh, do you use both PopDoc and uh, the C Bank, and or you prefer one than the other, or how, what's the best uh, workflow for your firm based on either Receipt Bank or PopDoc? Which one you think better for your firm? Yeah. I think um, right now we've been mainly focusing on HubDoc simply because that they can do the fetch. Um, but I know that Receipt Bank has a more powerful um, expense kind of function. Plus, they can do expense reports and, and that kind of stuff. And they're also moving into fetch. So we're definitely going to explore Receipt Bank, but at this moment, we're only using HubDoc. Okay. HubDoc. I'm going to tell Jamie that. Yeah. <laughs> so the other one question is, um, they seem you so busy all the time. Like, uh, oh, Bob is at all over the place. He's in Quebec, now San Jose. You now he goes to Toronto. He's do the speaker. So they want to know, um, how do you actually um know what's going on in your in your firm, right? Because you are the one actually own the firm, but uh, you are all over the place, do the sales and the marketing. You do not re really do the bookkeeping, right? So, how do you uh quality control? And uh, second, sec second of all, how do you manage your time as a firm owner? How do you manage your time to do the most important things and still grow? Yeah, that's a that's a heavy question. I know. So, <laughs> you know, in a service business, it all comes down to people, right? And thankfully, I have two amazing managers that I rely on them fully. Uh, one of them is G uh, Jean. She actually came to, with me to Quick Toronto, and some of you have met her. Amazing lady. She's a CPA as well, and she does quality control for me. And same thing with Lorna. She came out to IPVC. Some of you met, might have met her. Again, super amazing, passionate, um, and takes ownership. Like they follow our core values 100%. And so that way I can trust them. Um, so that being said, um, we have, so there's a book called Scaling Up, and it recommends that we do daily huddles, weekly meetings, monthly meetings, quarterly meetings, that kind of stuff, right? So we actually have a daily huddle. So every, every day at 12.01 noon, we use a software called Uber Conference, and this conference call machine actually dials out to all the employees. Sorry, in this case, it's just me, Jean, and Lorna. And then we get on the conference call together every day. And we talk about uh, three things. What are you focused on today? What's your KPI? And for, for the managers, their KPI is um, basically how, uh, what percentage of the client work is like good. So their KPI is you know 60%, 80%, 90%. And this, on a daily basis, gives me an idea of how are, are we actually doing on the quality level, right? And number three is what are they stuck on or if they see any opportunities? And the number four, this is something we added, is uh, are you on track or off track? So every quarter we get together and set a 90-day goal. And every day I just say, look, are you on track or are you off track? If you're off track, what do we do about it, right? So this daily check-in helps me just know what's going on in the company and keeps a pulse on it. Uh, the other question is about time management. So as a business owner, the the question you need to ask yourself is, are you doing something that only you can be doing? Are you doing something that only you can be doing? So um, the bookkeeping work itself, is that something that only you can do or can that be delegated? In the beginning, the answer was, yeah, only you can do it because this is a difficult task and you have the background. But now I have really competent people that can solve this problem probably better than me. And so I delegate it all. Sales and marketing, are you the only person that can do this? Well, yes, like now, yes, I am. But 
slowly that's becoming not the case. Like Lorna is really taking an ownership in um, d doing proposals, you know, d doing discovery calls, meeting clients, and she loves that stuff. So, hey, it's no longer something that only I can do. And so you start to delegate, right? And these days, uh, I'm exploring opportunities to expand into Calgary and, and Toronto. And we're also doing a lot of marketing stuff, like starting a podcast and, and um, you know, wanting to do more video content, writing, copywriting. So at this moment, I ask myself, is this something that only I can do? Yes. But in six months or you know, a year, is this something that only I can do? No, I can probably delegate it now. We have the budget for it. We have, we have the human capacity for it. Um, the other thing is our leadership de development class. The first year, the question is, is it something that only I can do? Yes. Next year, so now we're on the second, second, second cycle. The question is, no, I, I don't have to be, be the one leading it. So Lorna is actually leading our leadership de development program. And I'm, I'm participating, I'm contributing, but I'm not leading it. Right. So time management is, is all about doing the most important things and doing only the things that only you can do. Everything else, delegate. Hmm. OK, that's interesting. I, um, I doubt you can still do bookkeeping. Can you uh, <laughs> remember last <laughs> time we did one bookkeeping? I know. I, I know. I haven't done bookkeeping in a while. I, I mean, I keep I'm doing our own books. So every month, you know, I, I do the bank recs, I do the class reporting. We have, you know, three locations, right? Vancouver, Surrey, and then head office. So I, I do all of that. You know, I create the budget, I present to the board. So I just, I mainly do our own finances at this moment. And the question is, you know, is this something that only I can do? No, but I, it's, I, sh I should still keep, you know, doing it to, to stay in the game, to test out the, the programs, to be a practitioner um you know stay up to date so that's important to me um yeah but i, I haven't done a client file in a long long time oh but by, by long time i mean maybe 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 three months four months <laughs> I think what's that kind of, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah probably <laughs> okay there's two more questions we're running out of time but uh, we'll continue why is what's um the most question you receive at the qb connect when you do the presentation so what's the most people ask you? Because some people miss your session. They don't know uh, exactly what other people ask. So they want me to ask you what exactly the most yeah. popular that. Well, I, I don't remember, you know, the kind of popular question uh, because they are all very different. But I, I, can re I can remember a few questions. So one is like, do you do taxes, right? And we I answer that like, we don't do taxes. Yeah. Uh, we can get into that a bit more if you want. The other one is, uh, you know, how do you price? Like, do you do value pricing? That that came up. Um, and then, what's your hiring process like? Who do you look for? Um, I think, yeah, those are the questions that I remember. Well, the value pricing, your way to calculate is too easy, but it's not easy to actually do in other people's firm. They find the difficulty to do the way you describe. Like, you just Look at their revenue. Okay, this ten percent is. <laughs> how 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 the customer gonna accept that? I find that really really fascinating. And how did you make manage to make it happen to all your clients? Um, yeah, I mean, I I don't know. I don't really understand my customer psychology, but maybe it's part of that. That during that discovery conversation, I add a lot of value, right? And they're like, okay, this guy seems seems like he knows what he's talking about. You know, price is okay. So. You know, yeah, like, so I have that I have that ratio, basically take the revenues, drop three zeros, that's the monthly fee. And then I, I did mention that we go up and down based on scope. So, you know, if a client is, let's say $500,000, you know, my monthly price would be $500 a month, but you know, they have complex payroll, they have several classes. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna charge 700. Um, so there is, a, there is an art component to it, a gut feel component to it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. You, I mean, you, you got to try it, right? If, if it doesn't work for you, you don't, don't adopt it. This is just what we've done. It doesn't have to be yours. Right, okay. So the last question is about the wholesale billing. They, they want to ask you, do you do mostly wholesale billing in QBOA? Or oh, wholesale. Or you have pay by themselves? How do you uh, manage those people? You pay for them? How do you make sure they actually pay you? Because a lot of people, they said um, they prefer to set up as a direct bill my client. Right, and um, so they see the option says wholesale billing, 
but they are not comfortable with it. So they want to ask you, um, how do you decide which client you want to do wholesale billing and which client you want to do um, direct billing? And uh, how do you guarantee those people pay you when you do the wholesale because you get charged on your credit card? So that's the last question. Yeah, so I, I also prefer if the client pays it directly. Um, but if they do it that way, they don't necessarily get the discount, right? So, you know, for, for clients that are okay with that, uh, they direct bill. We do have some wholesale accounts, especially, you know, I think the, the other time there was like $5 for, for account or whatever. I bought a whole bunch. Yeah. So I got to, I got to fill those accounts. Um, for those clients. So I, I, I mean, I obviously don't charge at cost. So for example, uh, $40 license, you know, I got, we, we get, we have 50% discount. So it's 20, 20 bucks, right? But you got to add GST PST to that. So, you know, it's, it's like 22 or $23. So I actually charge my clients thirty dollars a month for any wholesale uh, billing because look, it takes my time to administer all of that. So I want to get compensated for it as well. But the client gets ten percent, you know, ten ten dollar discount every single month, relatively anyway. So I would say you know do do earn a bit of a margin on that if you are uh, doing wholesale billing. And how do I make sure that I get paid? So obviously, if you have if you have recurring clients. Add it to the recurring bill, like add a line that says, you know, reimbursement of QuickBooks, right? And then, uh, like, ask for a pre-authorized debit through Rotessa or Pluto or whatever you use. Make sure you get the pre-authorized debit information or credit card information, so that when you, you know, invoice them, you get paid right away. So that that's how we do it. But you know, if you look at our financial statement, you know, our QBO cost and our like reimbursement, it, it's zero because sometimes we don't charge for it, and so we lose the 20, we lose twenty dollars a month. Sometimes we make some margin. So overall, we're literally break even on on that line. Okay, so that's uh, I thought about something. If you um, do the wholesale billing, do you include that as your initial proposal? Yeah. So how clients so, this fee includes this and this and this, all the apps and the QBO wholesale charge. Do you list all the details in the proposal, or you just give them the lump sum? This is your pay. This is what we do. Do you include all the software in your proposal? Yeah. So I, again, I, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to this. For us, we include it. We say a catch up setup. This is how much we estimate it to be. This is the monthly recurring. This is the QBO cost. This is HubDoc. And we, we make those two optional. You can either pay for it yourself or you can pay for it through us. And then we have an a hourly rate for uh, out of scope um, transactions. Oh, sorry, out of scope work. So we we break it out. Okay, so the question for me: How many apps you actually use in your firm? Oh, I I, I... no HubDoc. You might have some. Yeah, restrictions. we use HubDoc. We use Pluto. Uh, we use Rotessa. Um, we. Uh... I remember <laughs> you might are gonna test uh, Expensify and uh, T Sheet. Yeah, so we're, we just implemented uh, we just implemented Expensify, and it's, it's really really good. Uh, and we're start to look into Expensify. Oh, because we have a, quite a few clients that give us um, like Excel pay, Excel expense reports, mm -hmm. and basically you know they have to approve it on their end through a very manual process, and then they give it to us, and then we enter it manually, and it just it's not very streamlined. With Expensify, you know the, your customers or sorry your clients. Employees can essentially build the expense reports, clients approve it, and once it's approved, it's automatically pushed to QuickBooks, and it skips the step for us to manually translate from Excel into QuickBooks, right? So it actually creates a bill payable um, based on the expense report, and all the expenses are already booked. So I think that's really, really awesome, and it's a win-win on both sides because then the clients can get a digitized version of their expense report and have all the receipts attached. So you know, I really like that. Um, and that's why we started looking to Expensify, so it's to, to create a win-win situation. And then, yeah, for T-Sheets, uh, we, we looked into that as well. We don't have too many clients on, on Timesheets yet. We just implemented Noify for our client. Um, oh, for the, the contractors, track that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I was wondering, because your firm, I don't think you uh, pay hourly to your associates. I was wondering why you use T-Sheets for. So it's just for your client, not for clients. your Clients. No. 
no, just just for clients. For some clients, they 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 would they would need that, you know, uh, cost plus billing and that kind of stuff. So do you deal with those clients? They don't do anything. They don't even know what you use. They don't care. But they every year they bring you a box of all the receipts, hard copy bank statement. What do you do? Do you just reject them to refer to somebody yeah. else? I, yeah. To actually make it work digitally. So, you know, when when they first come on or when they first inquire, I always ask them, are you interested in a recurring bookkeeping engagement ongoing? Or do you just want us to do your catch-up bookkeeping? And if they say, look, I just want you to catch up. I only want to see you once a year. Then I kind of make a call. So let's say it's summertime. It's really slow. We have extra capacity. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we'll do it. We'll, we'll do it to catch up. But if we're really busy, like now, just say, look, sorry, we don't do catch up bookkeeping. Good luck finding someone else. And so we really want to look, want that recurring revenue, right? That's how our business is built. And so, you know, if we have extra capacity, yeah, sure. If we don't, then just say no. Doesn't okay, sound so good. Thing. The scenario: If you have the capacity at that one month, how much time do you think it's gonna take your employee to actually scan or take picture of those receipts and the bank statement? We don't. No. We don't. Um, we don't because uh, the clients are not willing to pay for that time, and so I tell them, look, um, we're gonna do the bookkeeping based on based on your bank statements, but you have to understand that. Uh, you have to keep all the receipts for seven years, right? So we're very clear and upfront with them, and so they understand the risk. And you know, sometimes we offer like, "Do you want to scan us in?" They're like, "Yeah, sure." And I say, "Well, it's going to take us an extra 40, 50, 60 hours." Like, "Oh, yeah, don't do it. Just, just enter it, right?" So it's like they're not willing to pay for it. So like, why are we, why are we doing it? And so we basically just do the bookkeeping, catch up bookkeeping based off statements. We may or may not organize the actual paper records. You know, they they just keep it on their end. Oh, I see. So they just decide if they want to scan, keep a copy by themselves, or they just want to keep the hard copy. That's their own risk. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. That's the first time I heard. Some people told me, oh, I train my client how to take a picture of a receipt. I train them how to scan the bank statement by themselves if you have a catch up to do, because the bank feed in PBO can only do a certain amount of time. They cannot do like the whole year or two years catch up, right? Yeah, so for those for those large catch-up clients, you know, we we ask our clients to send us PDFs or you know CSV files. So with PDFs, you can actually turn those PDFs into a CSV through a OCR scanning technology, and so we import those transactions into QuickBooks to do mass catch-up. Wow. Okay. So you do offer that service? Uh, when Rarely. I don't advertise it. <laughs> <laughs> when you are bored, you like, oh, I'm so so bored today. I just want to do some scanning. <laughs> Okay, yeah. we are right on time today, and uh, yeah, that's all the questions from the survey and from yeah. people's messages. So uh, hopefully we can pick maybe one specific topic after maybe January, after the, all the conference, everything, uh, to see which uh, topics you have time to just talk that one specific topic for more deep dive. Uh, yeah. So we can I think that that'd be great. Let me know. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure if your program allows, but it, it might be nice to have people to be able to talk and, and share their video. That way, we actually have a you know kind of a fireside chat uh, with a more 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 people. We do have that function, but some people they don't have a microphone at their oh, Okay. Or yeah. So. Um, yeah. I See, I, I like you, Jesse. I like I like talking to you. I like looking at you. But you know, I, I like know. to look at some other people too, right? <laughs> So next time I will ask people, hey, can you prepare with a microphone and a camera so we can have a group interview? People actually see each other, have a real in person. Yeah, that'd be fun. Okay, great. Thank you okay. for your time. Thanks, Jesse. And, uh, talk to you later. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye.